We throw away a lot of stuff that probably would be kind of commercially successful because we think it doesn't feel right. Like yeah. we're we give it to other people or whatever. Like this song has too much of a chorus. Like yeah. fuck that. <laughs> we're better than that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you we gotta do make something that is not actually commercially viable and just fucking hammer it till it's good enough that it is. <laughs> That's how you stay a perpetual teenager. Oh man, I can't do this again. <laughs> you gotta be able to do. You gotta make bad decisions all the time. You know? <laughs> Throw away all your hits yeah. and then see how fucking good your record <laughs> yeah. is. Hi, I'm Andrew Trendle. You're watching Enemies in Conversation. We're here with the Hives. You are indeed at least two fifths. Indeed. So I saw you guys at uh, the garage the other night. Yeah. yeah. Very sweaty affair. Yeah. Very sweaty affair as they tend to be these. It's too much firepower for a venue that small, you know. It's almost like the core nuclear reactor is like overheating. You give the same kind of show like garage rock on a stadium scale, whether you're in a stadium or in a shed, so. Yeah, it's the only <laughs> thing we know how to do. Luckily, it's a pretty good thing to know. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, this 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 tour is like oscillating wildly between seven hundred, like seventy thousand people, and seven hundred. It's a particular set of circumstances, but luckily we're pretty good at both. <laughs> and I right, that was the first time you guys have been at the garage in twenty-two years. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Do you find yourself like pulling different moves when you like step into like? Was it like a new kind of muscle memory come in when you kind of go through a time warp like that? You mean if we remember what we did last? <laughs> yeah, and just the muscle like memory. <laughs> I think I only remember the loadout of that place. It was like cold and dark, whatever. Yeah. Not now, but it was back then. But I couldn't really remember the show. I just, it was kind of a, one of our early shows where we started getting like good reviews <clears throat> and getting popular and stuff. I mean, just 500 people or whatever it is, six, that was popular at the time. And I remember a review... It was like right when like the enemy and Kerrang and uh, like a bunch of people started paying attention and I remember some review there was like all drug references like the guitars are as tinny as the tinfoil wrapper on speed and stuff like, <laughs> like okay. I don't know. Have the reviews changed with age? Are there reviews? Yeah. <laughs> they exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always the same, like fucking five stars out of five, the highest are the best. That's what that's all the, all I see at least. What can you tell us about how you came to be on this um, this stadium tour? Because we we interviewed Matt Helders back in December, and he he told us how the Hives were one of the bands that the Monkeys would listen to, and they were just started out that made them want to make some noise in the first place. So yeah, I think they told yeah. us that like there was like the same week or whatever, same month or something when they started the band, they saw the Hives and the Strokes, and that was kind of that was kind of like their thing, like the thing that started it for them. And we've toured them in South America like maybe ten years ago. Mm -hmm and had a great time, so I'm, I'm happy they wanted us back. It's a really great tour to be on for us, it's really fun. And I think that band is like, I think Dark the Monkeys are fucking amazing. Like that's the only good, really popular band, and that's not easy to do. You know? <laughs> as far as in England, it's kind of normal to have like a band like Monkeys step up to something like this. Is it, do you find that like the, con the concept of stadium rock is different around the world? Mm, I don't think like, I guess there's a certain type of person or, or audience member that will only go to things in a very big place mm. that think that's like part of the experience. Like they maybe don't like the Rolling Stones but that much, but they go see the show because it's like a spectacle and a lot of people. I mean, there's always, there's, you know, there are people. I, ACDC, hats off. That's like the world's best band and they're a stadium band, I guess, in most places. I don't know, like, I think it's just like being massively popular, you end up in a really big place and then you figure it out. I don't, like, it's hard to, like, start a stadium band. <laughs> you have to kind of gradually become There's one. There's got to be money in that. Who do you talk to? There's got to be a lot of money <laughs> in it if you have a show that's minimal. <laughs> the pay-to-play stadium circuit. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty expensive. Pretty big. Just rent it, no, just guest list. Yeah. Yeah, but like what well, Pelle is saying, like maybe there's a certain type of crowd that goes to stadium shows. But I think, uh, I mean, what, what we're looking at here at all the shows is that that's fans. That's music fans. That, yeah. like, they all come, you know, Arctics, t shirts, and, you know, that's proper. Uh, but we've talked with AC, DC and Rolling Stones as well, and it's been, you know. Yeah. Really? ACDC DC is almost, that's almost, you know, three generations by now. Yeah. You, know, you have a granddad and a dad and a son, kind of. I think Arctic Monkeys is like two because there's a lot of really young yeah. kids at yeah. the shows, like a lot of like teenage girls and stuff. And have you found that with yourselves as well? Because there's always this, there's been a lot of like renewed interest in the hives. 
Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, and I think that's like for ACDC or whatever, like Iron Maiden or like, yeah. it, when you've been around for a while, you have to kind of pick up youngsters. Mm. Otherwise, like we had like a lot of bands that we liked and we're friends with and stuff and they would never get new fans. It would just kind of be the same ones, a few dropped off and the ones that were there cared slightly less. Your band and music dies along with your fans yeah, and yourself. Think- like there's, you know, for a band that attracts new fans, that's something that you know live on forever if you will yeah, yeah. you got to have some kind of regrowth you know <laughs> the shows are always energized too like the crowds are always energized or sort of re-energized by younger fans coming to the shows like at every show you get young people coming to the shows and that you know they they you know breathe a lot of energy into the show or they react to energy maybe yeah. if we're if we're you know you know, projecting energy that they'll react to that, you know, they'll know what the, you know, yeah. get yeah. into it. And like, you know, there's a, like, there's a lot of teenage girls, which is a great rock crowd because it's like the loudest thing in the world, like 50,000 teenage girls. Is, yeah, is only rivaled like, by like Formula One racing. Yeah, it's, like, it's a really great, <laughs> it's like, It's taking me sound. super fucking loud. Like, we, I remember we played that Pepsi Smash show and, and uh, yeah. that's the loudest sound I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> There's also been a kind of renewed interest in that scene too, because in the last, um, well, since the last record came out, we've had Meet Me in the Bathroom, the phenomenon of yeah, in, yeah. indie sleaze. I don't know if you're aware oh, of yeah, that. Yeah, that's like a, <laughs> it's like an Instagram account that does parties or something. Do you kind of feel that focus kind of shift back to you in the last couple of five years or so? Just people like hungry for this kind of primal. I mean, we notice, but we also kind of just, and then stuff happens around us. Yeah. Stuff, we just go straight and stuff breaks, you know? But it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's cool, I guess. I mean, you always hear like different, like, oh, rock is back, rock is dead, rock is this, rock is that. But it's funny, it's funny that it's like now like a, like a, considered like a historical event, all that shit. Like, you know, there's like, like me being in the bathroom, basically a history book about shit I did <laughs> when I was an adult. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's cool. You know, it, it was really cool when it happened. It, for us who were like in the middle of it, almost hard to realize how cool it was until after the fact that like because you have to remember how fucking terrible it was before that yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean for, no, we never really look back or reminisce about anything really i mean we we've tried we once tried to to celebrate our whatever 10th anniversary we missed it by a year so we're going to celebrate our 11th anniversary <laughs> that's the only time we tried to look back and do something with whatever we did before otherwise it's just like we've constantly been moving forwards yeah. You know, or at least trying to make new records and stuff like that, even though it's been, you know, kind of a lame-ass situation the last <laughs> 10 years or something. Well, but, especially because you guys predate that, because like 97, you guys must have, because you, you talked about how shit it was before that, you were surrounded by this. Yeah, like, yeah. It's not- I mean, I think that's <laughs> why, that's where you're right, because that, that stuff, like that kind of like garage rock revival thing, was not the start for us. Mm. Um, whereas, I guess, like, I can understand if it was, like... You know, that was your first thing. Like, we'd been around, like, we played with, like, hardcore punk bands. We played, like, indie pop bands. We played, like, kind of anything just to get a show. And what we were doing felt separate from all of it. And then this thing happened that was like, oh, we kind of have something in common with this stuff. And this stuff's actually good, like, strokes and white stripes and all that stuff. It was cool, but it wasn't like... For us, it already existed, kind of. It got popular. Yeah. But you guys are always writing your own history, anyway. I mean, the thing about The Hives is every record feels like a greatest hits record. Well, thank you very much. That's the nicest thing I, yeah. the enemies ever said about us. <laughs> I'm sure there's been something. Yeah, there's been some nice things, actually. But yeah, everything's history. I mean, like... That's got to be a five out of five. <laughs> Cut that. Maybe, maybe, like, maybe like a great assist by a really shitty band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are your best songs. <laughs> this is the best you could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also says that even if they're all shit, like, they're, at least they're getting better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe that's why it took us 10 years. Well, that's what I was going to say. So, yeah, 10 years, what the fuck have you been doing? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've been flailing wildly at each other, trying to make something happen, I guess. And, and yeah. then missing uh, Randy Fitzsimmons and therefore missing songs. Yeah. And you can't make a greatest hits without the songs, I suppose. Like, we've been playing fucking phenomenally, but there's nothing to play. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, also, we have that thing, uh, I mean, since we couldn't make records, we were still kind of touring, all, you know, Yeah. to a fair extent, at least. So we would, you know, pretend that we were busy doing something important, which I guess we kind of were as well, but not as important as making new records, you know. Yeah. 
which is, you know, crucial. I think if you're going to feel like you're a band who's doing shit, you got to make records. Yeah, it didn't feel good. Yeah, it didn't feel good. We weren't fans of the situation either. Like, if you're a fan of the Hive, you were angry with us. We were also <laughs> angry. Hope it never happens again. Whew. Ten more years, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sit on the couch. So, what can you tell us about when it changed and when you kind of, and what gives you that, when the compulsion met the ability to make a new Hive record? Well, it was about finding the songs, you know. And and when we got the songs through this, you know, fucking messy, like Randy Fitzsimmons dying. Mm. But once we had the songs, I don't think, and had decided on what to do, it kind of just took a year. It was pretty quick but, after we... Uh... And just like four weeks maybe of studio time, like four or five weeks of studio time. Yeah. And like a year of finishing it. So it's like, I, I mean, you can think you have something going, but you don't until it's actually going. And it's like, we worked our asses off right it, it when was, we could. <laughs> it was pretty quick in a way that was almost surreal to the point where you're like, this is actually becoming a record. You know, <laughs> like the, the stuff that we've been trying to do for so long is now, you know, kind of pieces are falling into place. So but also, I got to say, though, like also about that, uh, the uh, greatest hits thing, it's like we, we've always been of the opinion that there's a lot of fucking great rock music out there yeah. and in order to make a record that makes sense you have to add to that so like it's really hard for us to like oh it's really fun we just kind of jam something together and it's kind of cool you know we don't need to pay that much attention to it we do you know we yeah. can't it's hard to just like do something with your left hand and think it's fit for public consumption yeah that bit is uh, i mean we can sometimes you know find something when we're sort of jamming and stuff but that's if it, 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 it's not even half a percent of what the, what yeah. the process is about. One of the things I hear all the time doing these interviews is someone, wants, one in every four interviews, someone will say, we make it for ourselves and if someone else likes it, it's a bonus. Like, you don't mean that. <laughs> well, don't put it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You should say that next time. Yeah, don't put it out. Just listen to your But it's kind of, you're doing it's it. so fucking fun. Yeah. yeah. You can you cannot release it, but it's uh, for us. It's kind of you have to do it for yourself to a point where you like it, because if you're trying to kind of do something that'll please other people, I think you, I think that would be super hard. Yeah, like you'd have to go somewhere and ask them, "What do you think? <laughs> How, you do all, you like this one?" <laughs> yeah, it's really like it's hard work, and you also have to tour that shit forever. At least if you're the yeah, highest, yeah. like, yeah. and you're touring something forever that you think is like kind of okay like that's too it's too hard work for to do that i think uh i mean if you're making a record and you're not touring it you're just like throwing something together i mean if it, uh, us liking it is a prerequisite but it turns out and we didn't think this was the case when we were kids or younger that if we like it a lot of other people also like it yeah whereas yeah. we thought it was like well, let's just make music that we like no one will like it and no one will get jobs you know yeah that was kind of the business plan <laughs> Well, that's it. I mean, the Hives always seem like the quintessential party band. If you don't exist for a good time, then yeah, what's the MO? I mean, well, I guess it's kind of like the... Uh, sometimes it's not a good time making something that sounds like a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's like... That's true, because I think our thing has always been kind of trying to guard, like, kind of what we... Th it's not really the original rock and roll in the style of music, but the feeling of that, that it's not... It's just about making your brain explode with endorphins. It's not like, yeah, functional like being music electrocuted almost. or, yeah. you know, it's, it's supposed to be a physical reaction. Yeah, and it and it serves a function. It's and not, it's not tears of sadness. <laughs> it's, it's not music meant to like. That is about who we are as people. You know, not necessarily like uh, this is me bearing my soul about my divorce. <laughs> or, you know, I guess, I guess some people make art to understand themselves better, but a certain thing about the hives is like it's also kind of we think this music needs to exist. Yeah, and it's kind of also functional in a way, like you know, yeah, yeah, like partying or like getting people to scream and jump up and down at shows, all that stuff, like, and getting us to scream and jump up and down while we're rehearsing, like the that like endorphin rush is kind of like our life's purpose, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, what the Ramones are. Yeah. You know, it's a band who's, you know, obviously you react physically to their music, you want to jump around and stuff, and then they say weird shit on top of that. <laughs> it's just like, what is he singing about? Yeah. Does that kind of feeling in your synapses ever change, or your relations to that ever change, or your appreciation of it ever change? Remember, you had a quote recently that said that rock and roll is a teenager. 
Yeah. You know? I think it should be. Yeah. 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 It's like nothing more depressing to me than adult rock music. <laughs> 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 Or I like just think it's like, oh, great. You, it's, oh, great. You took away the one thing about it that was fun. Like now it's rock, but without energy. Yeah. <laughs> or like rock, but without you know, nuts, endorphins or whatever. I mean, I like Dire Straits. Like, that's my bit picture of an adult rock situation. I really like them, but I don't think it's what we should be doing. Yeah. A lot of people are making adult rock, so someone's got to take care of yeah. them. Yeah, there has to be some <laughs> bad choices in there. It has to be, you know, a teenager, you know, a kid trying to have fun, trying to figure shit out, or just, trying to just react to stuff, or just reacting to stuff that's around. I got a lot of energy, Great, but no direction. Yeah. That's rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. But that's not to say it's a diverse record. Um, so we've had the amazing lead single, Bogus Operandi. Um, you get some notes now. Yeah, kick it. Yes. The, the next single should be Two it's Kinds like of Trouble. Review. Two Kinds of Trouble. Banger. Album highlight. Rick Thank Maltz you. Radio. Loads of fun. And then the real surprise of the record is this kind of slinky weirdness of um, what did I ever do to you. Yeah. Mm. What can you tell us about the, the character of this record and what you were trying to capture? The character of the record that we were was trying to capture is, you know, the hive's energy yeah like we're one of the few whenever we play certain songs the way that we know how to play and the way that they're recording on this record or the way that we play them live i feel like industry leader you know like i feel like we're industry leaders in the field in that really narrow like yeah energetic <laughs> rock and roll field. fast paced you know energetic kind of you know rock and roll and punk and it's a good feeling and i think uh, you know from having been away for so long i think it both was kind of what we ended up doing from sheer excitement from you know have, finally having the songs and you know finally being able to go out and play stuff or record stuff and also it's kind of what you want to do from a, being away from it for 10 or 11 years or whatever it was mm. you want to come back with a bang you don't want to come back with adult rock like yeah. <laughs> no no like all oh, the hives have been away for 10 years and now they've matured it felt like really important to go the opposite way and like this has to be fucking stupid and childish <laughs> We felt like Even we had to worse come back. than we've been before. <laughs> yeah, we felt, felt like we had to come back and prove that we had not been much Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> and, and just like there has to be nuts and, and like, yeah, kind of. Because like the songs that are like the punk songs on this are almost like worse than our first record. Worse, I mean, as in like, <laughs> what the fuck is this guy, more what energetic, this guy you know? doing? Yeah. Like the bomb and, and yeah. um, Trapdoor Solution is like, that's almost like we've reached the ceiling of that thing. Like, yeah. And then, well, and I guess like, uh, what did I ever to do was actually kind of born <clears throat> from the frustration of not making a house album. Yeah. And we we bought a thing on like, the, in the, like the je- yellow pages. That's the, this guy made a prototype of a organ connected to a guitar, connected to a drum machine, connected to a vocal mic. It was all like a one band man contraption. Kind of It's fucking ridiculous. And <laughs> and he gave, the patent came with it when we bought it. And that song kind of came up with us experimenting with that, trying to make like, let's make some other kind of music like that's not a rock band. Mm. And we did made that song with it. Whenever that. we did stuff on it that sounded pretty cool, we thought it sounded a little bit like a poppy suicide. Yeah. Like that band Suicide. And it sounded kind of like a poppier version of that. And this is kind of one of those things. Yeah. Like, you know, it's really just like, I mean, what we, <clears throat> what we, uh, enjoy uh, as a band a lot of times like you know that thing that's uh, you know whatever band like stooges or craft work or you know early hip-hop what all that stuff has in common is you know a beat yeah and then someone singing over the same beat repeating for three or four minutes yeah very minimalist yeah uh, music you know which is what a lot of the music we like is very like minimalist and that's so hard to do because like then it's like building up every line has to be absolutely correct for it to work yeah Mm. Whereas if you're like, this po- song has 19 parts in it, like five of which don't have to be that good, I think. I want to be your dog or Rapper's Delight. Yeah, or yeah. It's like, there's actually like, there's an unspoken discipline to that. There's an unspoken yeah. genius to doing something that's kind of dumb. <laughs> it's really, really hard to do, especially since we're so smart, so we have to go against all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you have to unlearn things and be like, yeah, nope, yeah. nope, too good. <laughs> yeah. Or too, we throw away a lot of stuff that probably would be kind of commercially successful because we think it doesn't 
feel right. Like yeah. we're we give it to other people or whatever. Like this song has too much of a chorus. Like yeah. fuck that. <laughs> we're better than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you, you we may, gotta do make something that is not actually commercially viable and then just fucking hammer it till it's good enough that it is. <laughs> That's how you stay a perpetual teenager. Oh man, I can't do this. <laughs> you again. gotta be able to do. You gotta make bad decisions all the time. You know? <laughs> Throw away all your hits yeah. and then see how fucking good your record <laughs> yeah. is. So, see like emailing Chris Martin and Max Martin, being like, hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. have a hit, have a hit, have it, man. <laughs> yeah. I can't do anything with this. It's too good. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the death of um, Randy Fitzsimmons. I mean, for those not in the know, what can you tell us about Randy Fitzsimmons and the shadow he's cast over everything you've done? And it's more than a shadow. I'd it's say. like the Alpha it's, it's and Omega. It's the core. Yeah, it's like, the, it's like the core of our band. He's, I should say. He's like the core of our band. He's been, uh, you know, crucial to us even meeting each other in the first place. Well, it's more like, I mean, sometimes people say mentor, and I guess that's true as well, but it's also an, just another member of the band, really. And one with very, very clear opinions, which is is good, you know. I mean, it's it's helpful sometimes, you know, it can be kind of all over the place, and this could work, and this could work, and having some, it's like, like a producer mentality or something, I don't know. Yeah, and wrote all the songs, you know, so important you know very important and so losing him in what i understand is quite horrific circumstances we don't know we don't know the circumstances we just know that he was gone and then when we saw we found we saw an obituary and i mean sometimes people go oh so you're sad now that randy's died we you know we don't really know if he's dead or not we know that it, oh. we know that there's a grave and we knew that we dug up a grave and he and was not in it. He was not in it. And instead there were tapes and suits in there. We know that much. And so, I mean, for us, it's more of, I mean, I don't want to call it a sign of life because it's not really a sign of it, but it, it, it's definitely a, at least someone may be faking their own death or something. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think it's, uh, has a, you know, it's a good, a good sense of humor. Unless it's the you know to the if fact that he true, might be dead, so we don't really know. <laughs> yeah, if it's true, it's fucking sad. But at this point, if it's not, it's pretty funny. It feels <laughs> pretty decent. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, I'm, I'm gonna not like it's uncertain. We should say I have yeah. no idea. But. It's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but if he doesn't reappear or resurrect, you guys thought about what you do next? Not waiting not another ten years. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's just the answer. We have. It's it's. Uh, you never know. Like every Hives record has always almost felt like the last record we were going to make because mm. it's so much work going into it. And then we just go off touring like crazy. But that's the only way we know how to do it. Yeah. So then after touring three years, maybe or two or whatever it might be this time around, we'll, you know, we'll see where we're at. And we're making the first record you've made with uh, the Johan and only first time without Dr. Matt Destruction. Yeah. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about the shift in the chemistry? Because obviously everyone's quite attached to, to Matt. It's a big difference. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're very attached to Matt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's in the new video. Oh, yeah, I saw. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask, I mean, is he, gonna, is he going for an Oscar? Because his acting shots were pretty pretty good. He is, he is good. Fucking great. <laughs> he is a man of many talents. <laughs> yeah, and it's also because I, I, I don't think he knows all, at all times. Like Sometimes he just does stuff really well. And it's, I don't think yeah. he's, it's just like happening around him. He's very like charismatic and... A wonderful human being as well. I've been meaning to ask you. I mean, how are you? how's your recovery? Because um, you versus the microphone, who won? Uh, we're both still here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. Like I was swinging the mic, and then Mike Nicholas stepped on the cable. I'm not sure it was intentional or not. <laughs> and I and it made the cable very short and whacked myself in the head. But it turns out, I, as a general, I like, guess a total experience, I'd say it's positive. Yeah. People seem to really love the fact that I bled a little. I, uh, I'd gladly give him that, yeah. if that helps. You know, it was fun. It, the, before it wasn't the big thing, it was that I pulled my neck and that got inflamed <laughs> afterwards. Which is annoying, but I'm, I'm fine, man. Yeah. Way worse things have happened. Such as? Well, there's, I, I fell off the stage in Switzerland and passed out and finished the show then too. And It's like, kind of like, it gives you a chance to show that you don't give a fuck yeah. and you can keep doing it anyway. Yeah. That nothing can stop you. I kind of actually appreciate the challenge a little bit. Like getting hard on stage is like, 
this is my opportunity to not give a fucking fuck about it and just do it anyway. That's that. What, that's what makes a rock band real to you as well. Whenever bands, you know, if Dave Grohl falls off the stage and he comes back and finishes the show and, you know, with a broken leg or if, you know, people are throwing beers at a band and they don't don't give a shit, you know, what yeah. you see bands do and they just keep playing and, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of what, you know, what a rock band should be doing. As yeah. opposed to like, I'm, I have a splinter. <laughs> now we want to band. We can remain nameless, like leave the stage because it was too sunny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? No one can believe you after that. Surely no one buys your, you know, your, the your version of, of rock. The concept <laughs> that you guys are like badasses after that. Oh, you're gonna get sunburned. So do you think you'll be like the Stones and just going until you keel over on stage or turn to dust? I could think of worse things. Yeah. I think it's. I've always thought that it's either make one perfect album and just split after that, or keep going forever. Like those are the only two dignified things. Either you're you like the Sex Pistols or the Rolling Stones, like yeah. You don't really decide that before the fact either. Like if you want to be a band that's current and you know that's making music, I, I we don't want to be a novelty act going around you know playing our old records. We want to be a, an active band making music. If you're then making records and you go, this is not good enough, then you don't want to release it. You know, it's, it's you want to make good records. You want to make great records. They have to be up to par with whatever we put out in the past. Yeah. Which is the hard part, which is also the the challenge that you're facing all the time, which is great. Like, you know, if I had to be at, you know, a one out of five making a record, that's not interesting. You know, you want to be at the five out of fives. Yeah. Well, in that case, here's the 50 years of bad decisions. Thank <laughs> Cheers. you guys. Thanks <laughs> Thank for your you time, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>